Well, hello, everybody. It is wonderful to see from the chat and from the list of registrations the global participation in this webinar this afternoon. It really is one of the fantastic benefits of modern technology that we can be communicating and engaging with each other um, north to south, south to south, south to north in such an exciting uh, and dynamic way. So welcome one and all to this webinar this afternoon, this morning, this evening, wherever you are watching or listening. My name is Andrea Powell. I am the publisher coordinator for the Research for Life programme, and I'm going to be hosting this webinar today. Um, I have a couple of housekeeping notices for you before we get started. First of all, we are anticipating a very large number of participants today, so please do keep yourselves muted, and it's probably safest to turn your cameras off as well, um, if only to protect the bandwidth at, at, at your end of, the, of, of the, um, the chain. Please feel free to use the chat facility um, for any questions that you might have along the way. We will be allowing time for questions, uh, hopefully at, at a number of different um, intervals throughout the webinar, and then there will be time again at the end. Um, and we, we do hope that this will be an interactive um, session this afternoon so that you can get the most from it. So the chat will be monitored by my colleague Lenny, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with in his capacity as the co-chair of, of the Research for Life Capacity Development Group. Lenny is there in the background, um, keeping, um, keeping watch and keeping an eye on the chat. So without further ado, I shall start this webinar today. We are recording today, um, so the webinar will be available from our, our website at a later date. So I know that most of you on this call will be very familiar with Research for Life. Just a very, very quick introduction. Research for Life um, is an initiative that aims to reduce the knowledge gap between industrialized countries and developing countries by providing affordable access to academic and professional resources. And that background is important in the context of today's webinar in terms of how Research for Life is evolving into the future. But our primary motivation, our primary objective is to ensure that researchers in lower and middle income countries have access to the research information that they need in order to be able to, to um, do their jobs and also to improve the outcomes for their um, countries, their regions and their communities. Research for Life is supported by five different UN agencies, over 160 different publisher partners and a range of other partners from the library world and the technology community. Research for Life covers pretty much every discipline, every research discipline you can think of, and its scope is expanding all the time. Um, historically, these subjects on the screen in front of you, health, agriculture, environment, law and social sciences, scientific and technical information have been our core programs, but we are now adding content across the spectrum. Research for Life is available for institutions in approximately 125 countries around the world, some of whom um, have completely free access, the so-called Group A countries, and some of, uh, some of which um, are required to pay a small annual subscription for access to the content. Uh, but we have now over 10,000 registered users across the world, um, so we are really reaching many, many corners of the globe. Now we talk about the role of research for life in providing access to knowledge, but of course the needs of the users of that information are changing all the time. We know from feedback that we get from our, um, our users, either through a formal user review process or by the, the regular calls that we get to our help desk, that users of information and the, the consumers of the information that we produce or that we make available are also likely to be producers of research information in their own right um, and looking for somewhere to publish uh, and disseminate their, that information. We also know that the sustainable development goals are having an increasing impact on the nature of the research being undertaken, where it's being undertaken, and how it needs to be distributed to those who need it most to solve the, the key global challenges facing us as a global, global community. And of course, having access to information is really only one aspect 
of participating in the research communication ecosystem. Having access to information is not, should not be an objective of, of the development community. It's not an outcome of development, but it's a catalyst for further development. Without access to information, um, no uh, pro you know, progress is severely limited, but it is only one part of the picture. So why are we having this webinar today? What is it that we are focusing on? So recognizing these changing user needs and the increasing interest in the Research for Life community in the publication and the distribution of research as opposed to the consumption of it. Last year, in the middle of 2020, the Research for Life Executive Council agreed to set up a task force, an open access task force, which would have representation from all of its different stakeholder groups, all of its different partners um, types. And so we have a small but very proactive and very engaged task force made up of representatives from publishers, from UN agencies, from libraries, all considering this challenge around how open access is impacting on the lives of our users. And the establishment of this task force by the Executive Council recognise that open access publishing is, is, is a growing feature in the publishing landscape, but it has created some new barriers, some new challenges for researchers in the countries which Research for Life aims to serve. And we were, there was a growing concern that a fair and equitable transition to open access would would only happen with some targeted interventions from different stakeholders. We could not assume that a transition to open access would automatically remove barriers and make life better for the researchers and the communities we are attempting to, uh, to support. So the Research for Life Open Access Task Force was created to, in order to explore how and indeed if Research for Life could provide support to its institutions and users in their own endeavors to increase their open access publishing output. So it has a very targeted focus. It's a very specific area of activity, uh, which is why it's, it's a temporary task force rather than a permanent um, establishment. So the task force, which was set up last year, has now met once a month um, since last July for over a year. And we hope that it has produced some rather useful resources for the Research for Life community. This, this, the outputs and the work of the task force is going to uh, reach its sort of culmination later this year when Research for Life enters its next strategic planning cycle. We generate a new strategic plan every five or six years, and we're at that stage now where we're looking to the next stage in our existence and what sort of services we should be delivering, how we should be evolving as a programme. So this work of this task force is very, very important in taking us into that strategic planning cycle. And today's webinar is designed to explain the progress that we've made so far and talk a bit about what our plans are um, for between sort of now and um, October, November time, and indeed how you as our user community can help us in our work. So who's giving this webinar today? We have four of us, four speakers lined up for you. Um, you can see uh, my picture, which may or may not um, be a realist, uh, an accurate representation. Um, that's me, the Publisher Coordinator for Research for Life. Um, we have three other great speakers, um, Jess Monaghan, who um, who's director of, 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 of policy and performance of open access at Spring and Nature, Mike Donaldson, open access program manager for Canadian Science Publishing, and Matthias Astel, who's the chief journal development officer at Hindawi. And I'm first of all going to hand over to Matt to talk, us, talk to, to you, to explain to you um, about one of our first outputs from the task force. So Matt, I hope you're there and ready. I'm going to drive the slides and hand over to you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk us through 
the development of best practice guidelines that the uh, the Open Access Task Force has put together in regards to uh, article processing charging waiver policies. Um, I thought to start, uh, we'd actually have a look at the the output of uh, open access in the research for life countries. We can jump onto the next uh, slide there. As Andrea said, the needs of users uh, and researchers is changing um, and the requirement and the engagement with open access in the research for life countries has been growing pretty rapidly. Right? Since um, 2016 to now, uh, there's been an increase of over 150% in the amount of gold open access research articles published by uh, Research for Life countries. And that's higher than the global average growth of gold open access research. And so in, in the countries that fall within the, the Research for Life uh, community, there is a, a definite increased uptake um, of, uh, of gold open access. And we can see that all 45% uh, of all articles published by those countries in 2020s so or last year were gold, um, which has increased from just a roughly a third in, in 2016. Um, and 7% of all gold open access articles published globally um, were from the Research for Life uh, countries versus 5% of, of all other articles. So overperforming and, and overrepresenting in gold open access uh, across the board uh, within the Research for Life countries and growing rapidly. Uh, interestingly, just over 40% of all of that content, that open access research content is published by, by seven publishers and then a long, long tail um, of other, other publishers. But seven large international publishers uh, producing 40% of that published research. And within there, there's a range of approaches that have been taken to support uh, researchers in uh, publishing open access financially um, and primarily through waiver policies. We could jump to the next slide there, Andrea. And so effectively, over time, uh, all publishers or the majority of publishers have developed some form of waiver policy um, as an approach to support researchers in lower and middle income countries uh, to pay the fees that come from um, open access. And there's been many different ways in which those policies are structured, many different criteria, uh, a range of different processes, requirements, levels of discounting. Wow, it was an ominous interruption. Um, and so it's often hard for uh, authors and their, their institutions to um, at, at one level find uh, waiver policies to understand how much they will be, if anything, they'll be required to pay for, for publishing open access. Um, and then also to understand that criteria, it varies from publisher to publisher, sometimes from journal to journal. Um, and there's, there's a real lack of uh, clarity or consistency um, on, of waiver policies across publishers and, and no central location to find uh, policies for authors or their institutions to gain that, that kind of holistic understanding uh, of what. Um, apologies, I'll slow down slightly there. Um, of what policies would apply to, to what researchers uh, and at what time and under what criteria. So this, this creates an issue. For, for authors and for institutions looking to support their authors in understanding how much funding will be required um, to publish open access, to understand where um, the authors are eligible for publishing open access without uh, fees. And so as a, a group, the task force uh, identified this as, as an, an area where a relatively straightforward approach could benefit a very large and, and growing uh, open access audience. And so, to support this, we've set out to uh, create best practice guidelines um, for publishers to support accessibility to their policies. Um, we have a, a now a standard approach that we've um, published online that guides publishers in how best to develop and uh, make their waiver policies available within, with the aim of ensuring that researchers can understand where they're, when they're eligible and also what is required from them at what stages 
uh, to take advantage of uh, waiver policies. And the three very straightforward elements um, that are relevant to, to authors and their institutions is for publishers and journals to have specific pages dedicated to uh, a waiver policy and for that to be clearly linked from all relevant uh, sections. So when an author um, is assessing uh, a journal for publication, they can easily find any policies that may be relevant to them. Second is to uh, make those policies as simple and as clearly written as possible. Make it really easy to understand what are the criteria to be eligible, uh, whether they be uh, country-based or based on funding or, or so on, and what are the processes to then apply for that uh, waiver. Um, and thirdly, make sure to provide that waiver information as early and as often as is practically possible um, for the, the authors, so that it's not later on in the stages when the questions around waivers or so on uh, are raised, um, and it is transparent throughout the, the process, what is expected of the author, what, where the, the publisher will support. And in, in doing so, this enables there to continue to be um, a variety and uh, within the, um, the policies that are produced by publishers. Obviously, they support different uh, communities in different ways. And, and so a one size fits all approach isn't going to work. But this will help enable the, the clarity and the accessibility uh, of those policies so that researchers and, uh, and librarians and institutions can very quickly and easily understand uh, what policies apply to them um, and, and when. And so uh, we've already had uh, a number of uh, the, the publishers and a number of those seven that, that produce 40% uh, of the, the open access content from the L4L countries. Uh, have expressed support for the guidelines and have uh, taken on these uh, criteria for increasing accessibility and, and transparency in the, in the policies. Do you want to take that, Andrea? Or are we... Yeah, thanks very much, Matt. We'll, we'll take a, a pause um, to see if there are any questions that have come up. Lenny, have you spotted any questions that are relevant to Matt's um, slides that we should uh, jump in and answer now? Yes, I did. Are the total number of published articles related to all disciplines and can, is there any data that splits out what disciplines were highlighted or featured? Yeah, so, so that data was uh, aggregated across all disciplines, um, but did come from Dimensions, which as I understand it, the Research for Life uh, members have access to through Research for Life. And so it could be very easily uh, separated out into, into various disciplines uh, or regions or, or whatever uh, demographics would be required. Okay. okay. Is that okay, Lenny? We are okay to move yes. on? Yes, yes. Yeah? I just have some comments. Thank you. Very interesting and things like that. So we could okay. proceed. Okay, great. Thank you. And thanks, Matt, for, for running through those guidelines. Now, the the link to those best practice guidelines, if you're interested, was made available on one of the slides, which you'll have afterwards. So it's, it's very easy to find on the Research for Life website. In addition to publishers endorsing the guidelines and hopefully following them in the way that they communicate their waiver policies, um, another thing that we've put together, which we, we believe is of, of, of tremendous help, particularly to, um, to you, our, our library, to many of you, our librarian contacts um, in our user institutions, um, when you're providing advice and support to your colleagues um, who are seeking to publish open access. And this is an index to the publisher APC waiver policies of as many publishers as we can pull together. So we've been reaching out to all of our publisher partners. Good day, Band. Oh. Just remind everybody, please, to mute their microphones. <laughs> Thanks. So we've created an index um, by reaching out to all of our publisher partners to say, send us your, 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 um, the URL to the area on your website where hopefully you're following our best practice guidelines, but where we can point our users to if they need to, to learn more about them. 
So this link here um, on this slide, um, as you can see, it sits on the Hinari content portal, but it's very easily accessible to anybody. Um, and I've got a screenshot from it here as well that just shows you when you get there um, that you can link. Uh, there's an alphabetical listing of many, many different publishers. Um, and, and in fact, some of these publishers are, are not necessarily partners in research. Like we're trying to make this as comprehensive an index as possible. Um, so you can very easily check what those waiver policies are. Um, and hopefully um, that will help to, to overcome any um, misunderstandings or any obstacles when, it is, when, when a researcher is, is looking to see if they're eligible um, and how to claim. So moving on from, from the best practice guidelines, as, as Matt has explained, this was our first area of work as a task force and the first output from, from our discussions. And we felt that that was a really good start um, to help users understand how to navigate um, the, the complexities of the open access publishing landscape. But of course, open access isn't just about gold and the payment of APCs, article processing or publishing charges. There are other many other aspects around open access publishing um, that our users are asking for help with. And so I'm now going to, to hand over to, to Jess, um, who's going to talk a little bit about the next deliverable, the next area of work from our task force, um, which is a, a survey. And hopefully Jess is uh, can unmute. Great, thanks Andrea. And can take over from here. Thank you. Hi everyone, it's nice to, to hear from you today. And um, as Andrea mentioned, one of our next area of activities now is that we are looking to actually hear more from you, the user group, about what we can do to help support you with open access publication for your researchers. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, I'll give a bit more background into our thinking when we were developing a survey. So as a user group, we realized that what we really need is to hear from you, the experts, what role you might be playing at the moment in supporting your researchers to publish via the open access model. We're really interested to understand if this is something um, that Research for, for Life member libraries are, are working on. Um, and if so, what is it that we as Research for Life publisher members and other Research for Life members could be doing further in this area to, to develop our work um, so that we can be there to, to work together as, as partners to support open access publishing? Some of the questions that we've been thinking about and which we've included in our survey are really aimed to understand, do your institutions encourage researchers to publish open access? So we'd like to understand, is this a priority? Is it an area that's important to you as an institution? What kind of support, if any, does the library provide for researchers who are looking to publish open access? What kind of challenges, and I think this is particularly interesting for us, we would like to understand, are there difficulties that you yourselves as librarians, as Research for Life um, contact, and um, the researchers that you work with, what kind of challenges do you face when you're trying to support researchers in publishing open access? And then finally, the area that we're very interested in is what kind of resources or support would you find useful for, from Research for Life? And Andrea said, we've already identified understanding APC waiver policies, but we hope that there is more that we as, as members of Research for Life can do in this area. And so that's where we're really looking for your input to help inform this. And the way that we've developed this survey, we have a range of different questions on these different topics and some options that you can select from. But we also have options for you to enter free text, for you to write down anything that you would like to tell us about what you would find useful about your experiences with supporting open access. So who is this survey aimed at? Um, it's aimed at you, we hope, the, the user group of Research for Life librarian contacts. And um, so it's not intended to be a survey that researchers themselves have to fill out because we want to understand how Research for Life can work with our librarian contacts um, to then help you help researchers to publish open access. We hope that this won't take up very much of your time. We had lots of questions that we wanted to ask, but we tried to keep the survey as short as we can. Um, so hopefully it should only take 10 to 15 minutes, depending on how much detail you want to, to provide in the survey. And in terms of what we're planning to do with the results, we hope that the information that we can gather, that we can learn from your insights and your experiences 
will help us shape our plans as Research for Life for our future activities, understanding those needs and thinking about what further resources or supports we might be able to develop to work with you further in publishing open access. We hope that those surveys will go to inform the strategic plan for Research for Life um, that Andrea mentioned. We may also, if the survey findings have any interesting trends or insights, we may also consider sharing those findings in a suitably anonymized way um, externally so that others in the, the research community can learn from, and other publishers can learn from the findings of this survey and the insights that you've given here. So um, we really look forward to hearing your views on this. I think for all of us involved in the open access working group, obviously we're very keen um, to, to hear from you as the experts on what you need. Um, you can access the survey online now. There's a link on your screen and we will be sharing the slides after this presentation so you can access that link. But we will also be reaching out by email to contacts at Research for Life member institutions um, who have an active research programme um, and we would really welcome also any questions that you have now. Um, we'd be happy to take questions um, and also any comments and feedback. Okay, let's see. Someone said it would be important to invite librarians through an email to participate in the online survey. And I think you just said that. Could you send the survey link here? Could somebody, uh, I can't copy it from the screen, so could somebody copy it and put it uh, right in the chat? Okay. Absolutely, yes. I think once I've finished presenting, I will um, click off and find that link and put it in the chat. Okay, now we did come up with two very complicated questions, more for the previous uh, seg segment. Uh, one says, I recently applied to BMJ Global to submit a manuscript, but I was required to pay 50% based on my country class. Is there any way to get a complete waiver through Research for Life? That's the first question. And the second one is very similar. For me, it was very difficult that some influential journals, even after a 50% waiver, the publication fee exceeds six months of my salary. This actually limits our potential to contribute. So could we go back and address those, although I don't think there are very simple answers. For yeah. I, I can certainly pick up on those. Um, the amount of or the, the size of the waiver, whether it's a 100 percent, so a complete waiver of a fee, whether it's a 50 percent, that's very much down to the individual publisher policy. Um, now, at Research Life, clearly, the, we would love there to be no fees uh, payable at all, um, but the, the, the policy of each publisher is their own sort of business decision, and that isn't a, um, anything that we can um, necessarily influence. I think many publishers that, that, that um, we hear from are looking for ways to, to move away from the APC model and are exploring other business models for open access publishing. So it may be that over time, um, the APC disappears altogether, who knows? Um, but at the moment where there is a, an APC payable, um, it, it's up to the individual publishers um, to, to set their own rates. Uh, now, I think that it is an important point that even a 50% waiver is still a considerable sum of money. Um, and some journals, you know, if the, if the APC is several thousand dollars, 50% of that is still a, 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 a huge obstacle. And really, this is one of the questions that we would like to have more evidence to uh, about through the survey. Um, so if this is something that your researchers are experiencing, then please tell us in our survey, because then we can use that information, that evidence to explain to, um, to, to the the publisher community that setting an, a 50% waiver seems like a very good approach, but it's, it could still be preventing a lot of good research reaching your, your publications. So it, it, unfortunately, it's not something we can do now. Research for Life doesn't have the funds to pay waivers on behalf of its, its users, um, but we can certainly communicate the challenges that it presents to our community of publishers. Lenny, is there any anything else that we should pick up on no, before we're we move okay on? No, to continue. Can I, can I just add Thank to that? Uh, yes, oh, please. please. Go, ahead, go please. ahead, Matt, please do. I think it's always worthwhile for the, the authors of those papers to 
directly contact the publisher as, as well to see if there are additional support that can be provided. I know many publishers are uh, uh, provide good support to identify other sources of funding that, that may not be immediately obvious to to researchers or have uh, additional elements to policies around specific circumstances so wh whether they can demonstrate that funding is not available and, and so on so it's always worthwhile um, asking the question if there is not that, that additional funding available Thank you. So just to um, underline what uh, what Jess was saying, the, the survey that the, the invitation um, email will be going out um, over the next few days. The survey, we hope to keep it open until the middle of August. Um, and then the results from the survey will very much help us to to set our future strategy um, and to, uh, to 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 also in, inform um, the advice that we provide to our partner publishers. So please, when you receive that invitation um, email, uh, uh, then uh, please, please uh, uh, follow the link and uh, complete the survey. And we look forward to hearing from you. So our last speaker today is Mike Donaldson. And Mike is talking um, from the perspective of um, a, a science publisher, a not-for-profit science publisher in, in Canada um, about why this all matters to publishers. We know it matters to users, um, how to get their research um, more available internationally, how to um, improve, to, to establish their reputation amongst their peer group, or how to, to reach other um, researchers around the world. Um, but it matters to publishers as well to ensure that researchers, that research from um, the, the global south, from lower middle income countries is reaching an international audience. So I'm going to, to hand over to Mike next to talk a little bit about the motivations from the publisher's perspective um, that you might like to, to consider. Well, thank you very much, Andrea. And thanks to all of you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, as Andrea mentioned in her introduction, diversity is key to the scholarly research community. And I think especially as we transition to an open access future, it's essential that we do everything that we can to remove barriers and foster that inclusion for researchers and research for life countries who wish to publish their work as open access. Certainly on global scale, we're facing grand challenges. And uh, I think the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change are two very current examples that are affecting all of us that come to mind. And now more than ever, we need our research community to be really inclusive and truly global in scope so that we can come together to identify these challenges, gather data, collaborate and develop solutions that, that benefit everyone in a tr truly global way. So I think two key aspects to achieving that are open access and also global inclusion of researchers. As we know, research takes place in every country in the world. It benefits everyone to ensure that the scholarly publishing and research communities are as inclusive as possible so that, we, that, so that all voices can be heard. We're all aware that scholarly, scholarly research and publishing have long suffered from inequalities and exclusion, and these challenges still persist today but we're beginning to move in the right direction. Many of the principles that are developed on open access and also open science by large bodies such as UNESCO, who recently published their recommendation on open science, highlight equity, diversity, inclusion, as central tenets of an open future. So an open science or open access future. In their recommendation, UNESCO describes open science as a, as a global public good that should belong to all humanity and benefit humanity as a whole, which is why they advocate for science to be open inclusive, equitable, and embrace a diversity of knowledge. Until recently, open access has been slow to be fully realized. The subscription model has been our predominant mode of scholarly publishing for centuries, and most research as a consequence has been locked behind a, pay a paywall and inaccessible to many who wish to access it. Now, open access has begun to turn that on its head, and we are now seeing more and more content being made open. Um, but with open access, barriers have now been removed to access in the content, but there's still barriers in place uh, in terms of publishing the content as we've been discussing throughout the panel today. So the author pays uh, article processing charge that Andrea had just mentioned in, in, in response to her question, it's cost prohibitive to many researchers across, across the globe, particularly those in, in lower, middle, lower and middle income countries. And we do have waivers and discounts that help in some cases, but obviously they don't apply uh, perfectly across the board. So there's still some challenges there to overcome. Um, so I think what Matt described in, in terms of looking at best practices guidelines and, and our, the index of waiver policies that have been introduced, I think that goes a long way towards helping to remove that barrier, but 
it's there's still challenges there that we know we need to work through. So that's something that hopefully as we move to an open access future, we can begin to tear those barriers down. Author choice is also essential. And um, I think it's a key aspect when we're talking about the equity of open access publishing. There's so many factors that go into an author's decision on where they want to publish their research, whether it's the scope of the journal and how their article fits in terms of the content of the article, the geographic focus of the journal, whether it's regional, national, or international, uh, perhaps the reputation of the journal itself or the editorial board of the journal, subscription-based versus open access-based, there's a number of factors that are involved. But ultimately, publishers all want to enable authors to have choice when it comes to their, their decision on where to publish their work. Uh, this is why providing a range of open access options is beneficial, whether you choose to publish in a fully open access journal or perhaps a hybrid journal that has various open access options. And the article processing charge should not be a barrier uh, when, you, when you're trying to choose which journal to publish in. So, oh, thanks, Andrew. I was just going to ask you to advance the slide. That's perfect. So the future is open. Um, I think it's becoming increasingly clear that that's the case. We know that uh, there's been... A, a slow growth in open access, but in the past few years with, with large initiatives such as Plan S and a number of other uh, national funder policies that have been put in place that really promote open access, we've seen a real shift towards open. And I think that that really is the wave of the future. So currently nearly half of the global research that is published is accessible in one form or another, either through fully open access publications, hybrid journals, repositories, preprint servers, and as Matt showed in his presentation, this trend is also apparent for Research for Life countries, where we're seeing year-over-year -year increases in OA publishing. However, as Andrea noted in a white paper that she wrote recently on achieving an equitable transition to open access, we know that OA growth hasn't been quite as strong for researchers in lower and middle-income countries compared to other parts of the world, and publishers want to change that. As discussed, uh, consistency and trans transparency of waiver policies is a key element to reversing that trend. But as Andrew suggested in her white paper, we also need to, to work towards increasing the research capacity of authors. Uh, so that may include training that, that publishers can help with in order to make it simpler to submit and publish work in the journal of the author's choice. And I think publishers can and should play a key role in facilitating that. So will an open future, an open access future be sustainable? It's clear that open access is a benefit to researchers, it benefits journals, and it benefits society as a whole. But the sustainability remains a challenge to ensure that the transition from closed to open happens quickly while also managing the risk in that transition to, to ensure that publications are sustainable long term. So as many of you may know, publishers are experimenting with various business models to support the transition to open access. And depending on the success of those experiments and some of the pilot projects that are being undertaken currently, we may hopefully see a, a relatively rapid, rapid shift away to an OA feature in the next few years. And that may begin to take away that, that reliance on the article processing charge that many journals have in place. So as we transition to an open future, we need to ensure that OA remains truly open for all. And that's to say that the transition needs to be free of barriers, we need to find ways to include all researchers in this shift in order to enable a fair, trans transparent, and inclusive open access future. However, continued effort is required to get there, and it's going to involve stakeholders all across the scholarly research ecosystem. So that includes researchers, librarians, research administrators, funders, publishers, government, scholarly societies, and especially essentially organizations such as Research for Life that play such a key role in supporting the research community. So as, we, as we've discussed today, the Research for Life Open Access Task, Task Force is taking on activities and initiatives that hopefully will make open access more accessible to Research for Life authors. And we really value the input from the community here in terms of what you'd like to see as we move in this transition towards OA. I think the survey that Jess introduced is a great way to hear from librarians on how their institutions are navigating the transition to OA. But what else can publishers do to facilitate this transition? We're very keen to hear from those of you in the audience, researchers, librarians, other stakeholders in the research community. We welcome your thoughts on how we can work together for an equitable, diverse, and open future. I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity uh, to speak to you today. And Andrea, I'll turn it back to you. There Hello, Andrea. Hi. Uh, I just seem to have any questions that popped up in the last five minutes. Uh, maybe we give people an opportunity to add questions in chat, and yeah, you'll yeah. do a sum, summing, summing it up anyway. 
And also, perhaps they could raise their hand if they want, and we could absolutely, yeah, recognize so here's, them. Here's Charles. We we um with plenty of time. Um, we've got a raised hand, Jean Jean Sack. Oh, we have a question too. Yeah, one just came up. Might there be a role for Research for Life Friends of Research for Life in providing funds for open access in? LMICs. So that's a, an interesting question. Those of you who, who aren't familiar with the Friends of, of Research for Life, this is a recently established fundraising mechanism um, for, friend, for the Research for Life program, because Research for Life itself has no means of raising income other than through um, the Group B fees paid by institutions. Uh, Recognising that, that we, we could, um, in order to, create, to have better impact um, and to uh, raise awareness of Research for Life and all the good work that it does, um, that, that costs money and we need additional support. So we've, we've created a fundraising vehicle. Um, one of the things that we've talked about is, uh, it obviously, is, is once the funds are, are raised through, through Friends of Research Life, how might those funds be spent? Um, and they ha would have to be spent for the benefit of the user community. Um, the the idea of setting up um, maybe a, a, a bursary fund or a, 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 an open access fund um, hasn't been discussed yet. Um, that could that might be an area for for research for life. It would be possibly complicated to administer, um, and it would be difficult. It would create quite a um, a lot of administration uh, so it isn't the kind of project that friends of research for life has been set up to to fund um but you know if this is a newly established mechanism um and as um hopefully donations are secured then if a donor particularly wants the money to be spent in that way then that that, that could well be considered so early days with friends of research for life um, but we'll certainly keep it keep that under review and 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 see what kind of of, of need is is expressed there was a, as a hand raised. There's um, two many. questions yes. uh, yeah. related. So uh, you can uh, you can go to the hand first, but I have two yes. questions in the chat. Go go ahead. First okay. one. Yes. Is, is that Jean? I can't I can't tell from yes, here. Yes, it <laughs> is. Yes, it is Jean Sack from Johns Hopkins University. Hello, with... Jean. Hi there. Lots of experience from Bangladesh. I had a question about uh, fair data. Uh, the Europeans are ahead of, of some of the rest of the developing uh, developed countries in sharing uh, the data that's underlying many of the scientific publications, findable, accessible, interoperable, that is with Stata or, or other uh, statistical programs, and um, uh, retrievable. Anyway, fair use of data is very close to open access. And many of the journals are now requiring the uh, scientists, the writers to supply links or access to the data behind their publications. This is difficult also for low and middle income country scientists, but something to be on high alert for that mm. their data should be accessible to other scientists for kind of scrutiny and and for patterns um, that we see in uh, public health, particularly mm. fair use mm. is part of open access now. Mm. Yes, I think you make a very <clears throat> strong point there, Jean. And, and um, uh, I know from my previous existence at, at CABI, helping the recipients of donor funds to, yeah. to be to adhere to the policies that those donors have on the sharing of, of data um, is quite a big challenge. It was an area that, that uh, we found that um, those, those uh, research organizations, research organizations did need a lot of support in how to manage and share their, their data. So it's a definitely a growing area. I, I would put it into the overall um, umbrella of open science. Of course, open yes. access is a part of open science. And, and maybe um, one of the recommendations going forward is that our, if you like, our open access task force always become, evolves into an open science task force um, <laughs> and, and looks at the broader challenges around openness in, in, in general, because I think it's a trend that is that is absolutely um, um you know gathering pace um and yes 
when we when we look at I'm, I'm going to mention in a moment another another task force that's looking at researcher um, capacity building. Um, yes, yes, we need this, the training. The, too, this isn't this too. is an area I think where where there's going to be demand. It may not be something that Research for Life itself provides, um, but it could be an area that we we provide um, signposts and guidance on. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Okay. Uh, again, back to this fee waiver policy question. Will there be a fee waiver policy in the framework of Research for Life that we can share with our community? Uh, so I think Research for Life itself doesn't have a, a, a policy for fee waivers because that's the business of the publishers. Um, our guidelines are, are, are sort of best practice about how to communicate the policy once you've developed it. But I think the index that I showed earlier, the index to publisher policies um, would give a good, one could look at some of those policies and, and learn from those and maybe create for, for one's own use um, a policy that, that would be appropriate in their particular circumstances. Um, but it's not really the business of Research for Life to set policy um, on, on what, what should be chargeable. Yeah, since we're basically, we're, we're based on a partnership with publishers and UN agencies, and uh, there's a lot of collaboration, but we cannot request or demand or require publishers to do this or that. So it's outside the framework. Yeah. Okay, there's a request, there's a request here for the webinar in French. Ah, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll ask, we'll do our best. <laughs> Peut-être. <laughs> yes, we know that we, uh, that's an issue. And uh, at least uh, in terms of the MOOC, we're working on being able to create one and have one in the fall in October, November, yeah. uh, that will be in French. So we're trying to address this in certain ways, but right. I'm not I, sure about setting up a webinar in French. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I can see um, a hand raised. Abdel Karim Belhamania has his hand up. Um, okay. I think I can ask you to unmute. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much, Andrea, for the support you have uh, been provided us with for the, on different uh, subjects. And we have exchanged it last week about the topic and thank you very much for your uh, support and for your prompt response. And uh, my question was related to the fact that since there is, a part, there is a research for life partnership, can that policy be operated between research for life and the participating publishers? Or uh, can a given institution within an eligible research for life country develop its own policy of uh, scholarly publications and include uh, a, a paragraph in the policy that includes that there is a fee uh, waiver possibility and can elaborate on that point in its own uh, particular policy mm. of uh, scholarly mm. publication. That yes, means. so I think you, um, thanks Abdul Karim. I think you, you make a couple of good points, which is that many yeah. research for life institutions are developing their own publishing programs. Yes, and, but and we are, need to act within the research for life program to be recognized. Yes, absolutely. And, and first of all, there are a few things. First, the publications from our institutions, that's, um, that's certainly something that we, we're see, we have another committee that looks at how we can develop our content strategy to include some of the research outputs from our user countries if they're not already available through Research for Life. So that's the first mm -hmm. point. And I think the, um, the, 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 the other point is capacity building in publishing skills. So it's helping to develop yes. publishing skill, not just publication skills. So mm. research and publications, but actually publishing as, a, as an activity. Um, and that's again, something that, that um, could be um, developed as a future opportunity. Mm. Um, many of our partner publishers already work um, in our user countries to, to help mm -hmm. local publishing initiatives. So it is something that is, that is uh, I know a lot of our member publishers are very keen to, to become more involved with. Um, so I think if, if you're looking, I would say, use the resources that we're prevent, presenting today. So that index for publishers policies, use those as examples 
um, and yeah. and maybe pick out the, the bits that you think are appropriate for your own activities um, and then sort of keep keep in touch with us watch this space for further capacity development around um uh, well, around publishing research for life anyway just to give more credibility for our uh... Yes, yeah, and I'll certainly take that point away, which is about exposing your research through the Research for Life platform. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Of course, if you're, if you're, I should say, if you publish an open access journal, and I believe yours is, your journal is an open access journal, yes. if it is listed in the directory of open access journals, the DOAJ, mm -hmm. we will already be picking it up. So we, yeah. we already pick up an index, all of the open access journals that are listed through the DOAJ. So in fact, uh, can we can be indexed on Hinari? Yes, you may or you you may already be there. If you're yeah. in DOAJ, we already okay. have you. If you're not on in DOAJ, that's the best and in fact indeed the only way at the moment to, to get your journal included in Hinari or in any of the okay. other research for life okay. programs. Thank okay. you very much. Very much Thank appreciated. Mm. I see. Andrea, there was a related question about that, which I think you just answered. Might research R4L consider hosting OA content? So yes, so I, so yes. Hopefully that that's made it clear. If it's an OA journal, then and if it's in the DOAJ, then we automatically we already pick it up. So we already have about all. It's about forty percent of mm -hmm. all of the journals that we already list in in our index in in Research Life. About forty percent come to us directly from the DOAJ feed. So. You know, that's a, that it means that a user can go to the Research for Life portal and search all of the open access journals, as well as all the other journals that have been made available by publishers. Then quite a number of the other resources, so whether they're books or maybe some reference resources, if they are open access, they're also linked through the, co the content mm. portal. So we do have a lot of open access resources already available. I, I see a, a hand. Um, from um, Reem Hamdi Mohammed, if you'd like to unmute and ask your question. Hello. No, are there other, other, I don't see any other hands. We're heading towards the end of our slot. So I think what we'll do is we'll maybe stop there with questions and move on just so if everybody could could remute themselves um, while we just finish up the, uh, the session. Okay. There our is a question oh. from Flateau. On the yeah, chat. our colleague from uh, the WHO office in Maputo, <clears throat> is reminding us about focus in the focus is on English and French, tend to forget Portuguese and other languages. As the result, the publisher go directly to countries and just contacts for products which are already provided via Research for Life. And uh, these countries are contributed to the UN agencies for which support the programs. Okay, so there seems to be uh, Flatiel, would you like to explain this uh, a little uh, by uh, speaking directly about it, about the issues with the Portuguese uh, countries and the publishers? It's a little unclear to me. Is it, is it is it a question? Is it an issue related? To it's more I, I think, a comment. Yes. I, I think yeah. I think maybe we'll just park it there because I think what we're we're obviously this, the focus of today is very much on the open access side. Yeah. If we're talking about accessibility of of other of non English or non French non, other language content, we can pick that up at another time because that that's that's quite a complex matter. But of course, we do have a lot of non English content already. Yeah. Available. Yeah, but it, well, I think what he's saying is that the publishers. Uh, the material is in Research for Life, but sometimes the publishers go and try to uh, go directly to countries and get support, get contracts where already the material is available. Um, I'm not mm, that sure. sure about that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm conscious of time. I think we need to, to carry on. Um, but thank you very much, everybody, for the questions. And of course, there's always an opportunity afterwards. If something occurs to you, you want to ask, then uh, 
do contact and any of us, um, uh, Lenny or myself, um, and we'll do what, whatever we can to answer those questions. Uh, or indeed the, the, the help desk, although I'm sure they won't okay. thank me. In the for, chat, uh, it says, uh, Flathiel says that that is correct, what I said. And there is a hand from Hamdi, if we still have time for one more. Okay, go ahead, Hamdi. Yes, um, first of all, I would like to thank you for this very interesting meeting. I really feel refreshed every time I meet you. And I think there's always a hope when I just listen to your future plans and your vision. Um, um, I'm actually contacting you to, um, to suggest something. I work as a reviewer in a number of international journals and, um, and also an advisory board member. Yet when I access these journals for a publication and my publication gets accepted, they say we cannot offer you any weaver, uh, though. Uh, we can make um, an advantage of our being uh, reviewers for free, but we might have some sort of a weaver uh, for the article processing charges um, in, charge in, in, in exchange for our services as being reviewers. So um, if we are trained through the research for life, why don't we just create like or, or initiate a group of reviewers that belong to the research for life and we start like accredited team of reviewers by the research for life for those who cannot afford the, the expensive application fees and they can act as reviewers for these journals and in change they can have a chance to uh, publish their work what do you think do you know i think that's a great idea I yeah, you're training us every now and yes, then. Why don't we yeah, just use this and make yeah, use of it so that we yeah, can pass by yeah. bypass this obstacle? And um, it's be, it's going to be beneficial. You will follow up our training, and we will belong more to the research for life. And this would be just um, I think it's um, a great step to help um, researchers to make the research be yes, uh, disseminated yes. if it is a good piece of research, of course. Yes. I don't mean like all the researchers. <laughs> For the, I, I had one research recently accepted um, in the ELR, and when I sent it uh, as a manuscript to one of the big journals, they said it's okay, but actually we suggest that you uh, put it in the open access portal because um, this research needs to be um, I'm sorry for that. Needs to be accessible to everyone. And then when I um, approached them, uh, how much will the fees be? They said, oh, it's going to be um, uh, several thousand of dollars. I told them I work in Egypt. I cannot afford this. And the 50% uh, discount and I afford it. So I just uh, kept this research in my library to read it. Though the abstract, up till now, I received requests from people. Uh, uh, did you publish it? We need to know the. Uh, the, uh, yeah. the mm. yeah. yeah. I think I think what what you're explaining is 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 another reason why we're running our survey because I think there there I are so many challenges. Um, faced around the whole publishing process. Yeah. It isn't just about yeah. where, yes. you know, paying a fee at the end of the day. But I think also, yes. and, I'm, and I'm going to just come on to my next slide because we have another task force um, that's operating in, in parallel to the open access task force. And that one is focusing on publishing and research communication more generally. So it's looking at the kind of capacity building that we might be able to offer in future to help researchers not just publish, but also to review, to become parts of, you know, members of editorial boards, to become more involved in the research publishing process and the research process itself. So I think there are there are lots of opportunities. Our challenge, of course, is what, what can we achieve given our limited resources? Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think maybe possibly an, an idea for this group to think about is a sort of a, an accreditation model for um, research for life users, if, if we're providing capacity building in, in reviewing yes. skills, yes. could that, that, that yes. then create an accreditation that you could then take to a publisher and say, look, I've yes. been trained properly, I've been accredited, um, therefore yeah. I deserve some... some um, that's gonna, that's some, some that's that's going to be great if you if you did yeah. this the capacity building in the reviewer for the reviewers that would be a great initiative and we can uh, overcome this obstacle because yeah. reviewers definitely they will do a good piece of research they might of course need peer review but it will definitely make a difference if we help them to to mm. get through this mm. so thank you so much and i well, hope we you. have uh, something about it soon okay <laughs> thank you I, I don't want to over promise but uh, there's lots that we could be doing thank you very yeah. much Amdi. matthias has added something to chat please everyone look at that uh, at hindawi we are currently tra trialing a similar idea to provide reviewers with 
APC discounts and waivers to recognize and reward their valuable work as reviewers. That's great. Okay, That's great, so yeah. that at least yeah. there's uh, uh, one attempt at dealing with mm. this in that way. Mm. Excellent. Yeah, thank oh, you so much. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. It's, it's now at the top of the hour, and uh, so our time is up. But I would like once again to thank you all for your interest and your attention and coming along to listen to us today. And a big, big thank you to my three fellow presenters today who've put uh, a lot of effort into the task force over the last year, but also into preparing for this webinar today. Um, so thank you all for um, attending. Please, if you receive that invitation email to complete our survey, please complete it. Give us the kind of um, the ammunition that we need to, to take research for life into new and interesting areas that are going to support researchers not only in their in their um, uh, efforts to to digest and consume the research from 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 others, but also to contribute their own research to the to the mix. So, yeah, and with within twenty four hours, the presentation and the recording should be available. So encourage your colleagues to uh, listen to this or at least review the presentation. Great. And thank you to Mercy and to Lenny for your support on the, the, the back end of the system. So hope to see you all again soon. Goodbye.